So our next Good. speaker is uh, Nitsan Gutman. He's uh, going to be talking to us about optimizing open SIPs cluster management using distributed backend systems based on RabbitMQ, Elastic, uh, Elastic Search, and RabbitMQ based on Elastic. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. And more. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. All right. So, first of all, it's very exciting and. Could not hear uh, One, one. Can you hear me? Now you can hear me. No. No. One, one. One, one. Oh, now you can hear me? Yes. Yes? Yep. I'll just talk out loud. No worries. So it's very exciting to be here again. Uh, the OpenSIP Summit is always an exciting place to meet other geeky guys that understand our language and joke. And uh, it's uh, really exciting to be here again and be part of this community. Um, the long headlines that you were uh, this I will try to make it a, a funnier, better uh, presentation than another boring microservice uh, uh, kind of uh, look at how I build it uh, kind of presentation. Uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, who we are, the evolution of topologies, um, kind of how to think of creating the best topology and a little bit about the challenges when working with the microservice environments. So first of all, uh, Voice Center, myself, uh, me and my ugly twin brother, Shlomi, uh, started the Voice Center in Israel uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago. We're a licensed ISP, a little bit more than 100 employees. Uh, we develop a lot of real-time communication platforms, uh, very concentrated on the, focused on uh, contact centers and cloud contact center solutions. Um, uh, we also uh, work with uh, my dearest colleague, Alex. Yeah, 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 the MC, Alex. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to not use your title. Uh, uh, together in operation in the States and uh, together with Giovanni from Open Telecom, providing a voice switch solution for a telco operators and organization, and it's a very pleasure uh, to be here with them. Uh, about myself, uh, I got released from the uh, engineer combat unit about 15 years ago from the IDF and joined my twin brother into starting this operation. Uh, we've been developing projects for organizations, governments, and entities worldwide for the last 15 years, uh, very focused on open telecom, on open source tele uh, telephony, and uh, generally on open source. Uh, really big uh, uh, contributors, and uh, I'm very enthusiastic uh, to support uh, uh, open source projects wherever they are. Um, so a little bit about microservices. Um, we'll not do that again. Relax. OK, I'm sure you heard a few of those. Uh, but we are talking about the major problem of transferring from a system that is very monolithic, very one point of failure, one gear, one equipment that you just put in some kind of a data center and you pray it will work. And I guess about a decade and back, it, always, it used to be like that. Then you, you, you were able to do a monolithic uh, system, and that will be like a, a general uh, understanding that that's the way things work. Um, as a, maybe as a CEO, it's very good to see uh, that you bring me a, a box that does that stuff. Just give me one box. Don't get, get me too complicated. One system that does it all. But the more the more the years further uh, we go down the years and we need more advanced stuff, this monolithic uh, dream becomes a nightmare uh, because it's really hard to uh, uh, fulfill the high availability and the flexibility needed when you're blocked into one equipment, one vendor, or one system without the ability to continuously develop your system. And I'm sure that the crowd in this room totally understands the importance of continuously developing, and I guess this is part of why you're here, other than the great Amsterdam atmosphere. And this is really a, a one of the a biggest reasons to move from a monolithics to others. And the humanity has tried to solve it by trying to move to a, a layer-based solution. And I just 
got an idea for a good example about uh, uh, why layers not necessarily <coughs> work. Uh, you know that we have a, a dual redundant elevator in the building. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, we're all stuck here on the fifth floor, cannot go down without elevators, even though there were two. Uh, and now we have, uh, uh, you know, um, I guess something left over from the DevOps environment, the uh, service elevators, that for emergency stuff, we can move the pockets over there, but there's no real uh, uh, guarantee that we, it will really continuously working, even if you have two in high availability. Uh, so I can, you can guys fix the elevator now. I got the point now. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you for your help. And when we move from layers to mere microservices, obviously, and then again, it's even more obvious in microservice, the less single points, the better, but then again, it's more complicated to maintain, to monitor, and that's exactly the challenges we'll progress and talk about. And wait, wait, uh, where is the uh, mic for this? Is it here in the room? Yeah, you saw that? I got you a cat and dogs in the presentation. Good. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is like a general microservice topology, okay? Uh, everything is like this, it's very simple to explain. And this is part of the uh, challenges, obviously. If we try to, uh, I see people actually focusing on that. That's there's no point of remembering this structure, guys. <laughs> go on, go on. Um, you want but, me to explain that? <laughs> yeah, you want to go over that with the CTO? No? You're working against you. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. He has hard questions again. Right? <laughs> so, when we talk about finding the perfect topology, if you take two engineers without any previous knowledge and ask them what's the best topology, they will already have an opinion, for sure. But the point is, when you try to plan and think of the right topology, you first need to analyze what are the requirements because there's so many ways to deploy the same stuff uh, in multiple or single data centers or topologies with multi failovers and have like this bad experience once that we had a round robin container that was also load balanced with an Nginx and also had the DNS failover and by the time something got wrong it was impossible to find it. So overcomplicating high availability can also be a disadvantage and you need to really think about the requirements not as to let's do everything the best you can, but really think about the requirements before you just shove in more and more configurations and stuff into your system. Uh, the requirements are really a very long list. We try to narrow it down to what's really about microservices, that is the requirements that are different from other places and we found that First of all, geographic location, which is something that is more and more uh, out there now that people need dual data center or more than two data centers availability. And we're all on this uh, with the OpenSea 2.4, any cast uh, support and clustering support. And, uh, and this is a, a very important uh, a reason, a requirement that needs to be answered. We, of course, have the capacity. How many calls or sessions this system needs to hold? Obviously, there's no point investing in high volumes when you need low volumes, but with uh, more flexibility. Uh, existing technology use. If you need to use uh, ISOF to integrate into a SS7 telco operator, or if you're stuck with an old GenBand in the network, or Nortel, or whatever you need to, God forbid, in Nortel to, to, to integrate, uh, then uh, it's really something you need to think of in advance because there are very specific limits into what these uh, technologies and existing uh, uh, gear uh, is supporting. And generally, interoperability, you go and usually no telco operator or a big organization is coming and purchasing his uh, telephony system or uh, whatever microsystem, uh, microservice system uh, from scratch. It's always integrating into something that already exists and you need to make sure it's interoperable uh, operable with other stuff. And something that people sometimes forget, of course, is the budget. Because you can always overkill a project or a system with many demands and many requirements, but then you will not meet them, the budget needs. And that's, of course, part of the requirements. It's 
not always uh, just let's make it right. So what is the perfect topology? Obviously, there's no perfect topology. It really depends on the situation and on the case and on the requirements the situation has. But the different reasons, reasons that these requirements are always changing is the geographic locations that scatter, that dis are distributed with our new systems, uh, the functionalities that needs to be provisioned, and uh, uh, the multi-tenancy uh, that each one of those devices, servers, hardware, gears, is, is serving multiple clients and so not just a single client or just a single thread or a single task. So that makes it more complicated to manage and uh, review and monitor, etc. So the challenges I wanted to uh, uh, mention and show a little bit about the tools that we uh, used in order to overcome uh, are the observation, okay? All the DevOps, the, the creation, the continuously installation of servers, the uh, the monitoring of the systems, the integration of the systems to other uh, platforms, and of course all the logging, which I'll discuss later with what we're doing with the RabbitMQ and the Elasticsearch. So, about the observation challenges. We obviously have uh, several of them, the network, the functionality, and scaling the resources as we go up and down as much as we need. About the network, so obviously the new solution we mentioned many times here last year and this year is the AnyCast and the OpenShift clustering support. And this is something that I will respectfully, even, I even put your picture on, man. Okay, yeah, you, do you see it? You see it? Yeah, I see it. Very good. Tomorrow, that exact time, 3.30 after the... Uh, it doesn't make me feel very special. No? Ah, because I didn't <laughs> put your picture on it, now you're jealous? <laughs> if I looked more like a cat, everything would be just fine. <laughs> So definitely come to Alex to uh, uh, speak tomorrow and hear all about it. Uh, but just in general, I'm not taking all the fun of it, out of it, relax. But just in general, and two main uh, reasons to use the Anycast. First, of course, is the high availability and uh, you know dual data center high availability that even if data center goes down, the calls continue flawlessly and the end user do not feel it. And uh, not just the server, a whole data center. And the second one is more about the localization of the servers, getting them as close as possible to the end user to avoid any latency issues, and of course other packet loss and uh, uh, network issues that obviously as long as you're, for, the further you go, uh, the more guaranteed you are to at some point to meet some network issue. So about uh, the provisioning challenge. This is something that uh, I believe you will find interesting that we, part of the need to provision parts of the system in a dynamic and in the right way is an example we did with the provisioning open SIFs to tell the free switch into which URL to address when he's doing his URL uh, 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 requests. So we have actually, uh, we used it in our case study to have the distributed queues solution. So once we have a, a call center queue with the agents from around the globe, uh, what they call follow the sun feature that, you know, wherever you are, uh, 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 guys are, will be there and be available. Uh, what we have is uh, we use the offensive that is actually managing the state of all the agents, the calls and everything uh, in order to, um, uh, identify uh, the incoming call that is coming for that queue on which agent it should land, redirect. And if the agent is in the US, then the free switch already knows to communicate using the CURL model in front of the US data center and information system. And obviously, just the same way, if the call was meant to a European agent, uh, the call would have went to a European data center, and this is very uh, helpful with managing the network. It reduces uh, uh, latency issues and international networking issues that obviously are less stable than intercontinental uh, networking. And uh, this has been a, a huge uh, step for us uh, in uh, making stuff more uh, uh, simple and operable and stable. And of course, you can find that on our uh, free switch uh, uh, repository for download if you want to use it. Um, 
One other thing that is really nice that I think that is nice to mention that we uh, managed to overcome the, uh, um, the barrier that at a certain point uh, our servers were scaling up and the users were using more and more channels and we noticed that we need more servers in our system. And uh, we found, uh, we found uh, working with the, uh, with the Linux containers and uh, Proxmox to be very reliable and very flexible to our demands. We actually see when file decryptors or hard drives or CPUs or load averages or whatever sensors you, you have uh, are uh, reaching certain limits uh, and that <coughs> redirect tells our system to just put up more containers to consume and to operate and to perform the needed job in a way that is really uh, bringing the cloud computing into the internal uh, network and allow us to uh, offload resources as much as we need and to stay flexible with demands and peaks. Uh, so this is really a nice tool that we were using for that. About the monitoring challenges. So of course we have many services, many different services that we need to monitor and there are many, you know, operation systems, equipment, data center services, ports, so many things that you can monitor and think about and this is like the, the enormous amount as more as you grow and add more features, the, the more that this uh, uh, becomes a really hard challenge. Uh, the geographic distribution, it demands network connectivity between each one of the microservices. And what we have sometimes after that is the chicken and the egg problem. For example, we log into a server and we see that the hard drive is filled because of a log file rotation that we didn't even know that exists that starts filling up with no log rotation and uh, uh, it only happened. We don't know if it's the chicken or the egg or is, is there a bug that caused this log rotation to fill up, jamming, hard, hard, jamming the hard drive, causing the server to crash? Or is it just log rotation, the hard drive filled, and then the server crashed? So you really need to have the logs uh, indexed and filtered in the right <coughs> way so you can uh, uh, extract them and get business intelligence out of them in a sec and not start digging into jigs of CSV files in order to try and find your answer. Um, and one more thing that we added, so I'll get to that in a second. So. Basically, the basic monitoring is something I'm sure everyone are doing. I'll be responsible not to. And, and you know, basic ICMP pinging, SNMP trapping, and, and monitoring, and of course, HTTP monitoring to make sure everything is up. Uh, uh, that's nice, and that's good, and that's very important. But in a microservice environment, you can have, and you can encounter a situation when the service is just answering 200 OK, no matter what is being asked, for example. or other stuff that can get wrong and you really need to check its functionality and not just that it's up. And so uh, uh, we use a, a functionality testing, a simple API testing. Uh, we check the response time, the latency and stuff and the valid response. Uh, but we also developed end-to-end -end solutions for uh, uh, using the open source common market tools available. And uh, we use CPP for testing for a, a uh, checking, uh, uh, you know, concurrent calls capacities and other uh, uh, performance under uh, high volumes. Uh, we're using Verisip, actually, that's a nice example. We're using Verisip uh, automated call testings. We actually have DIDs around the world and an automated dialer dialing those DIDs, playing them a record, which is recorded from both sides, and then we analyze the audio from both sides of the call, match it to RTCP statistics, and understand if we have a problem or not. We see, okay, we can see if there's caller ID issues, if there's uh, uh, latency issues, if the problem only exists in specific providers or specific locations worldwide. And one of the extra tips that if you're going that way, just make sure you watch your international calling bill. Uh, we got this system, you know, spending hundreds of dollars before we thought of a simple, stupid algorithm that examines how many calls we have to each one of those destinations and calculates the ratio of testing those like, uh, destinations by the amount of calls to make sure you test once an hour a destination where uh, you have millions of calls but 
only test it once a day if you only have a few dozens or thousands of calls per day. Um, so this is uh, one uh, nice example for a testing platform and uh, the Puppeteer. Uh, the Puppeteer uh, is a great tool. It's usually used for UI testing and automation uh, when you build like a web interface and we're using it really uh, we try to push as much as we can A to Z processes into the steps this puppeteer is performing so it doesn't only uh, go to a website and see that it's up it's actually logging in it's uh, creating a new user it's creating a new SIP session it's trying to make a call using that new user that was just created Etc. Etc. And all those flows are continuously developing in our internal systems to make sure that more and more monitoring is being performed. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, if something is a bit slower or not uh, behaving the expected way just before we launch a better version, we know it in advance. Um, and that's a nice part that we added uh, uh, a few years ago. Shlomi wrote it, I believe. No. You, Rasban, Rasban, Rasban. We were lucky enough for Rasban to rewrite Shlomi's code, so it's actually working. And uh, we have the uh, latency update uh, model that actually uh, allows us to know every time uh, 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 the end user is sending a, a keep alive message, not only his uh, latency and the loca user location, of course, that he has, the NAT and all the parameters behind it, and we also gather other real-time st real statistics on him. For example, what's the current calls that he's having right now, or which queues he belongs to, and other real-time events that all, all related into that entity in mind that is the extension sending the latency uh, packets. And uh, we, of course, send it all into a RabbitMQ that then goes through some logic before it goes into an Elasticsearch index and ready for us to pull and know the information when we need it. Um, all right, so the integration challenges, uh, it's a whole world of itself. Uh, as I mentioned before, when you come with a microservice platform, it's usually into an existing platform, or you have other platforms that you need to integrate. If it's an existing billing system, or a CRM, or ERP, or you name it, there's a tremendous amount of systems out there that uh, 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 poten potentially need to be uh, uh, connected into integrated with and there's of course all those multi-versioning of all those different devices and systems and uh, always changing needs you know by the time you end uh, selling a, and uh, uh, implementing a solution for one of the customers uh, half a year later the manager replaced and suddenly a whole new set of features come into the exact same company, same doing, same actions, and changes suddenly, uh, uh, the need suddenly change. So uh, it's something that is uh, commonly happening, and you need to uh, remain with the flexibility to continuously develop and integrate. And this is why we um, are using, uh, I want to mention two different uh, tools that we're using. Uh, the, Jenkins, the Jenkins server, uh, in order to do the DevOps implementation, and you know, uh, 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 every night after the developer ends up developing his feature branch, he already has it <coughs> implemented automatically every few minutes on a live server in a data center, which he can actually do live testings on. And of course, other uh, methods that we're using for it. And uh, uh, that's a nice uh, little uh, project that we just published on GitHub a few months ago. We call it My Swagger Hub. Uh, it's actually a, a MySQL scheme uh, that is used to uh, um, create Swagger file, JSON file or YAML file. And anybody here knows Swagger? Really? Okay, so I will do the the few sentences that saying that. Swagger is just like a, a, mark club, a, mark, a markup language that um, helps developer uh, um, define the right methods and parameters uh, in each one of the parts of his system in a centralized way, which really, really helps developing systems in progress because every time uh, we think of a new feature that demands a new field to be added to some kind of an object somewhere out there, Instead of thinking about the three months roadmap it will take to 
find all these locations and track them down, make the changes, make the test scripts, make the entire global uh, system test after uh, before you launch. You just uh, have this tool that you uh, add to the Swagger, and the Swagger already generates the backend files, the SQL, the MySQL uh, functions, and many other tools that makes it really fast for us since we start using this solution to uh, uh, progress and uh, uh, add more and more features in a much faster organized and documented way, which is really important as, uh, as far as you grow and more and more people and hands and chefs are getting into this uh, uh, nice dish. Who sees an old lady? Who sees a young lady? <laughs> you know that? Okay. Don't see the face. You don't see the face? That's a different problem, man. <laughs> you should definitely see a shrink that then. <laughs> okay. My point here is that when you're looking at data, when you're looking at stuff, let's just take, for example, the simplest user table that I'm sure everyone has in their system somewhere. Just the user table with the user ID, username, and user status, and I guess a few, few more parameters, right? When we look at it internally from our inter, inter uh, uh, systems, uh, internal systems, we would like to perform specific methods in specific volumes with specific permissions uh, that we just, for example, the simple method of adding a new user, which is something that obviously we need to allow uh, internally for our UI systems and APIs to allow. But then again, if an external user wants to use one of our a, APIs to add a new user, he's more than welcome, but obviously it's going to be on different servers, different platforms, different load balancing, different networking and security, different DDoS mechanism, different WAF, different, you know, all those different stuff that comes around. And if eventually it's the same add new user method. It's the same object, same answer. But it has to be, that's one of the uh, uh, suggestions that we found to be uh, 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 very important and adding a lot more reliability both to our internal and to our external APIs is the fact that we split them out into two different arrays of uh, two different systems. And so definitely security, robustness, and scalability are there. Uh, using the right integration technology where we should. You obviously have different communications uh, protocols from the uh, UDP, you know, from uh, synchronic to asynchronic communication, ba basically. Uh, and uh, uh, other than the UDP and the HTTP, we, uh, as I mentioned, uh, started using RabbitMQ and the AMQP protocol for message queuing. And that really, really helped us get our system much more robust, much more flexible, much more uh, intensive uh, as we could just add another queue to the rabbit and solve it this way in a way that will uh, sometimes was not possible in a simple way like that. So, uh, login challenges. After talking about all those great microservice uh, challenges, mm. uh, the biggest one and the last one I want to touch is logging everything. Usually the problem is that logs are scattered on multiple files, in multiple servers, in multiple data centers, in maybe multiple universes in one day. But the point is it's really hard to unify all the information from those logs and get a fast answer as to what went wrong with this call or what went wrong in this server for that time frame. And so it's really difficult to cross-reference those logs and to see what happened uh, on the computer operating the soft phone while the server was getting the error messages. Whose fault is it? Where is it? Without seeing the entire global pictures, it's really hard to find out what happened. And you need to have the right logging filtering because all this big data is enormous and you need to find a way to index it, index it and map it in advance so you can really pull it out and use it rightly. And of course, security and regulations. I also had this a uh, um, uh, um, Pulp Fiction picture with the, if you say GDPR one more time, you know. <laughs> so I didn't want to use the same picture, but I'm sure we all heard at some point on the GDP, GDPR curse. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So the login challenges. 
And obviously, as I mentioned, we have open tip free for each aspect, CGA, info, micro SIM, provisioning systems, Node.js, backend and frontend, a recording program, you know, Nginx or a, a Apache and other, you know, a, a, a load balancers and UI and, you know, every action the, inter the user is doing in the interface. And all the billing actions, the logs of the billing action, not the billing in themselves, but their logs, and all the access lists granted and uh, 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 disgranted. Of course, all the RTCP statistics and many, many, many other logs and active uh, 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 actions that, uh, events that are occurring in the system. And what we're doing is just, as you see, pushing everything to the rabbit, making sure each one has its own queue. So you can pull it out and address it in the right way, in the right uh, uh, priority. And sometimes, just for example, when we use the RTCP statistics, uh, the RTCP packets, uh, which uh, I assume most of you know, but I'm just making sure, uh, it has all the latency, the packet loss, and all the uh, network performance statistics inside those packets uh, of every uh, uh, SIP call, of every uh, actually uh, uh, RTCP stream. So uh, those RTCP streams are actually uh, sets of a few seconds of UDP termination, uh, SDP, uh, like the SDP has uh, declared termination of UDP packets, and uh, you do not usually have it correlated with, for example, the country this stream is eventually destinated at. Okay, because the destination is part of the call of the CDR, it's not part of the stream. So we need, you need to, for that example, take all those RTCP statistics, put them on a Redis on the side, and as soon as you know the CDR and, and the full duration and the destination and the billing and all the other stuff, you can collect it all together and have one object that has everything in inside it, put it back in a different queue now, because that's like a, a more sophisticated log uh, object, and only then push it into an Elasticsearch already indexed by the account ID or by the server source IP or you name it, whatever you want, to easily extract it with everything together, not trying to assemble different kind of logs from different systems with different timestamps, just to try and find out again what happened. Um, other than logging, of course, without logging, someone looking at those logs <laughs> uh, uh, and actively doing something about it, it's pointless. And uh, what we used is uh, we actually are, I did left the SMS and email here, but I must say that we are really, really satisfied, satisfied with the uh, Telegram application uh, uh, integrations that we've made. We actually made different groups of checks to different escalation groups in our company for different uh, 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 decision makers and different uh, 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 responsibilities, including uh, 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 customers that wanted to uh, be part of this group, we just created a new uh, group for the customers, so they are also exposed to the alerts and the notifications that are concerned to their uh, uh, gear and equipment and system. Um, <clears throat> so, after uh, other than alerting and sending notifications, important uh, notifications about it, it's really, really important, and I just mentioned it in a sentence before, about the indexing and mapping of the information into the Elasticsearch or any big data. It's really, really important, and if anyone here has already de dealt with Elasticsearch, I assume we already encountered the, uh, that mismapping or misindexing stuff can really uh, uh, get th things slower as more and more data gathered into the system. And you know, uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to index an IP variable, so index that as IP, so the system will be easier to search by and to search for IP ranges and other functions that are not good for text indexing or uh, integer or float calculation. So uh, that's just one example out of many that uh, if you do want to index stuff by a uh, IP range, you really need to have this IP in a, a IP a IP type data type. Uh, so it will be easier to aggregate the, the data that you want in any way you want it. Um, of course, one of the powerful tools for monitoring and alerting is the active and passive actions that our system is taking. Uh, we configure different thresholds for different monitoring levels and logs. For example, if a certain extension exceeds uh, the amount of calls per second or the amount of money spent in the last hour, five, ten, day, week, or 
if the total count is exceeding, or if he's talking to a normal, uh, abnormal uh, destinations he haven't spoken before, and so on and on and on, and all those algorithms that are there to identify any fraud or a, 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 a suspicious uh, traffic. But then again, if we would have blocked any suspicious traffic on our systems, we wouldn't have any customers, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, you need to be very gentle about that, and this is why we have certain different threshold levels. Okay, the first one only alerts our knock and some of those telegram escalation groups I mentioned before. But if it reaches a certain point that is already, I don't know, for example, a single agent already passed the 100 bucks a, 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 a daily revenue, that's obviously abnormal in a way that no matter what time of the day you want that users stop making calls. And this is where you uh, actually take the active parts, uh, uh, you take the logging and all the alerting and make it active by disabling the user, opening a ticket, sending him an email about it to avoid his frustration of the downtime and explaining what happened and on and on. Uh, also a different example for that is changing a faulty route. As soon as we see the RTCP statistics and uh, MOS is degrading uh, and we understand that this there's some issues with this provider, SIP provider, with this route. We don't need to wait for customers to complain and then change the route. We can dynamically do it automatically and just alert us that this has happened so we can uh, further go uh, into it and see and open the tickets and you know uh, uh, look further into it. Um, so this is some pictures from uh, uh, our uh, dashboard and uh, this is actually part of the RTCP statistics dashboarding. As you can see here, this is just one example of the views that actually combines the ASR <coughs> with the uh, average call duration, with the average MOS, with the packet loss and the total calls. And these statistics uh, are not really uh, all together usually and they need to be uh, indexed together in order to show, for example, uh, uh, the MOS average of almost five in all calls and you see the worst MOS uh, in the blue drops in specific calls, and you can, of course, uh, uh, further analyze that, go into that, and uh, uh, see uh, further information. Uh, this is an example of our heat map. This is uh, obviously a good example for seeing uh, one of the servers here with lots of reds uh, on the pocket loss view. Uh, you can see that this specific source IP server is suffering from some kind of pocket loss. Uh, at the same time, other servers in that same data center and other data centers have not severe, uh, suffered from that. And you can narrow down, and this is just a nice example that just pops out a, a suspicious server to be wrong. It might not be the server wrong. It's maybe uh, lots of uh, 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 users with bad connections are connected to it, right? But it definitely lights out uh, and emphasize uh, if a, a potential problem might arise somewhere just before uh, uh, the customers complain about it. And this is another nice view of our system. Again, when you index the RTCP statistics together with the country, you can finally see each country and the average MOS, the ACD, uh, the total minutes, the total calls by country, by ordering, by filtering, but whatever you want to do. And this is, this is a, a nice example for a view that you can see on the left side the filtering that's possible to do. And then if you see that some statistics are uh, um, awkward and you want to further in investigate, you can filter more and more uh, parameters and narrow down the problem into the specific uh, issue. Because you know sometimes troubleshooting voice, is uh, voice issues, it's this top to bottom, bottom to up, top to bottom. OK, this customer is suffering. Any other customers have it? Oh, the other customers are having it. Wait, they are in the same data center or not? Wait, they are in the same data center or not? OK. And this, <coughs> Trying to narrow down the system is in, we try to design a system that will just allow us to click our thoughts this way and narrow down and find the exact timeline of where it started and what's the real source of the problem uh, without opening a Wireshark, I promise. Okay. So, after we log all this stuff in, together um, and uh, we put it in uh, 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 Elasticsearch, as I mentioned, we need to make sure that it's secured, and we need to make sure it's departmentalized, which means that not every customer can view other customers' logs, right? Each customer's logs are, are 
part of the GDPR uh, uh, protection laws data that the logs are also part of the sensitive data. They have the phone numbers, might have user IDs and other stuff. And you really need to remember that when you're managing logs. Before the GDPR, we managed log rotation by the size of the hard drive, right? I mean, there's no point deleting logs, right? Anyone here deleted logs not automatically, just for the fun? <laughs> Making sure, OK, I'm not the only one. Good. So we actually, I swear, we actually delete logs. Yeah, I admit, it's like a support group, and and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, the part of it. The twelve steps. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> deleting, yeah, the, the leading logs exactly. So, guys, I delete logs, and uh, a part of uh, uh, the need to departmentalize the information in the logs and to make sure they're only accessible to whoever. Uh, indeed, they have the permission to do so, and only for the time is permitted to do so, and on and on and on, all those. We uh, are using a very nice, great solution that I highly recommend, the read-only REST, uh, which is a solution uh, uh, that allows you to use the Elasticsearch edition, but it also allows you, in case you're using Kibana, uh, to departmentalize the indexes of the Elasticsearch and to allow different users logging in into the Kibana you only be allowed to expose to the indexes that, for example, contain their account ID in the pattern, or any other tools that you can go very flexible with uh, that make sure that even if you want to give your customers the benefit of enjoying the Kibana and all these wonderful tools, uh, you don't need to uh, uh, compromise the security of the data and the logs of other of your customers. Uh, so the read-only REST is really a great uh, tool for us, and uh, we're using it, uh, uh, of course, with the JWT, and you can just shove into the JWT payload anything you want, and then use it later on when searching and uh, indexing uh, on the Elastic. And yeah, this is me putting it black on the white that I actually delete logs, I swear. And when you do need to delog this, uh, delete those logs, Usually you do it by age, but I swear I had more than 20 different conversation only in the last year with different legal advisories from different departments of big law firms, and each one of them has a different specific specification as to how we should delete the logs in order to comply with the GDPR. So we had people's telling us delete all the call logs of calls more than 60 seconds, or delete all the calls of a specific data center, or of a specific DID number, etc. So you do not only delete the logs by the size of the hard drive, as I said before, you need to classify it. And if it's a more sensitive uh, information, you need to de delete it earlier. And if it's not that critical, and then you rather leave it for more than a month or two, or maybe a year or two. And by the content and the business rules, and again, as I said, per the client's sick legal advisor needs. <laughs> you might get sued for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not dealing with uh, any uh, legal advisor. Thank you very much for your time. I hope it wasn't too boring. And uh, enjoy Amsterdam. Thank you, Sam.